need to talk about Europe, I guess, and uh, if I understood the speakers this morning correctly, that's a bit of consensus uh, that we have and that I'd like to join in. Uh, I guess we need to talk about Europe more often and I dare to add also more of us. I'm always embarrassed when I come here that there's uh, such a lack of um, representation on part of my um, fellow Western Central Europeans. Um, I know it's not uh, due to the unwillingness to invite these colleagues, I have no idea, but I certainly think more of us should more often talk about Europe. Um, the topic, you've seen that, right? Uh, diverging path, federalism versus coexistence. I may add that I think this is not a new task, new topic, new challenge in the history of the European of European integration. Um, and yet, I think we should certainly address it. It's an acute um, question. Um, I don't think we're going to solve it here, and I don't think it's probably ever going to be solved. And uh, that's, uh, as you might notice, in the end. Uh, the main, um, the bottom line of, of what I want to present, that it's not solvable and that we should still or all the more keep talking about and addressing this issue. My specific um, topic is dynamics of supranational integration. Um, and I'd, I'd like, to, I mean, I would have labeled it integratedness rather than integration if it weren't for the awkward sound of integratedness. But um, I would, would like to make clear right in the beginning that integration so much sounds like a, um, a process, a targeted process. And it, for a long time um, in the European uh, history of European integration, this didn't matter too much, this kind of sophisticated distinction between integration and maybe whatever. It, uh, might be meant by integratedness, but I think it does so all the more, so I might add this element up front. Um, it's 20 minutes and only 17 left, so it's a short talk, and here's a brief overview of what I'm going to address. Uh, a very brief uh, attempt to remind ourselves of what the EU is or what is peculiar about the EU um, and why we have it. Uh, Second, the prices we pay, that's the uh, most extensive part. And lastly, the question of uh, are there any ways out or do we even need a way out? We'll see. Now, first step, uh, conceptualizing the EU, big phrase, um, stipulating its purposes. Um, this is, I'll be very brief, this is something you all have been <laughs> um, faced with so often. Um, the EU, oftentimes labeled as this community sui generis, a uh, great point to make and at the same time not particularly um, laden with con content. So oftentimes, and I think most, the absolutely dominating paradigm in an analyzing the EU is to somehow juxtapose it with, on the one hand, what we know from the international sphere with international organizations, its starting point in a way, and nation states, something that we also all know in public law and are very familiar with all the institutionalizations. Um, and somewhere in between, we try to locate the EU, as I said, a very common paradigm. You could apply it to development of democratic participation, you could look at the separation of powers, you could also look at vertical separations, federalism. Um, we have heard part of that in Peter's talk earlier about um, applying these terms to, to an EU setting. So multiple ways to characterize the EU somewhere on this continuum and obviously um, as you, European integration used to be conceptualized and has been, I think, a progressing um, development. Uh, this is a moving target. Moving, arguably, towards more and more integratedness, more and more nation-state-like um, structures. And yet, 
I think uh, this paradigm is useful in order to explain, understand, somehow maybe also teach European Union law. Um, I think it's mis misleading at the same time. And it's misleading because it fails to grasp the sui generis aspect. Um, and so in a way, I have to take the sui generis as a starting point, uh, elaborate on it with this old-fashioned continuum paradigm and maybe return to the sui generis and we'll see um, whether that's uh, any way useful as I try to move on. Um, stipulating the purposes. First of all, I'd like to um, remark that asking, even asking for a purpose of the EU is one of the distinguishing elements if you compare it with a nation state. Uh, it's more like an international organization characteristic. You only ask for the why if it's not a given. And most nation states tend, even though they are of course also historical artifacts, they tend to perceive of themselves, portray themselves as a given, an institutionalization beyond question. Different for the EU, the EU has been, always been, um, looking for a purpose, an aim, at times also a target, the finalité, right? Um, so if we again, once again refer to this continuum, the fact that we need to stipulate purposes of the EU um, might be one of the lasting and essential features of the international organization roots in this um, institutionalization. The answers given to the question for purposes you'll all be aware um, and acquainted with that, uh, have changed over time. Initially, it certainly was mostly about preventing military conflict on European soil after the trauma of the Second World War. This main motivation soon faded or, well, at least left center stage to the pursuit of prosperity. Uh, common market generated efficiency gains, uh, a more prosperous community gains for hopefully all involved. And I think this was the historical terms, uh, the paradigm that had been dominating for the longest time and still has been around of course. And in recent years I think we have more and more come to perceive of the EU as an institutional response to challenges, policy challenges that transcend the capacities of nation state based policy, climate, migration, etc. So, a base, maybe also foreign policy, um, internal security, maybe. So, multiple policy goals uh, that require a platform if they can only be targeted <coughs> beyond the nation state. And I might um, add that the moment you get into um, this kind of new rationale, um, of course, the yardstick can be tough. Has the EU managed to um, be a platform for, say, the challenges of migration, migration policy? I'll leave that for you. Okay, uh, I should also add that these uh, purposes, even though they have been more or less prevalent over time, um, certainly um, have remained valid even if they are not in the foreground anymore. I think um, speaking about the EU as an institutionalization of, of preventing um, conflict, mitigating conflict and uh, well, making actually war inconceivable between those um, who are part of this community is a lasting um, rationale behind that. Okay, uh, next one, the price we pay, and that's I think the most salient, most interesting element um, of what I'm trying to uh, present to you. I mean, obviously the first one is very simple. The price of supranational integration is the loss of autonomy on member state level. One could easily elaborate on that in multiple dimensions, but you all know that. That's in a way a truism, of course if you share competences policy making, if you enter into a, um, 
institutionalized long-term uh, cooperation on a political level outside, beyond the nation state, this will entail some losses of autonomy. What I think is more interesting are the problems that are inherently associated with uh, supranational governance. And that's something um, that has been around also for a long time as a discussion. Many of the items you see here will be maybe unfamiliar in, a, in their phrasing, but certainly nothing new. I would still like to briefly um, elaborate on some of them um, before I then try to draw some conclusions. And I should also add, the list of inherent problems of supranational governance certainly not exhaustive. First, um, one I'd call the implementation challenge. Again, if we use this paradigm comparing the EU to a nation state or an international organization, it very much looks like a nation state if you adopt a separation of powers paradigm, if you just look at the organizational chart. You have an executive branch, a judiciary, a legislature. If you look more closely, you'll see the legislature is incredibly active. We know about that, right? It's almost at the level of nation state. It has a strong participatory component, whether we label this like a federal system, bicameral, etc., and qualify uh, the same statement by saying, well, but it's the least integrated federal system out there, or whether we still leave it with another um, other label doesn't, re doesn't really matter. The key message here is the legislature is really strongly developed. But if we look at the other two, if you look at the court and the executive branch, the judiciary and the executive branch, you'll see that they are mostly truncated. They have the top level, but they have very little of the substructure. There's no European police, no European tax officers, no European welfare agencies, etc. Very few of these compared to what we see on a nation state growing, problematic maybe, but certainly clear disparity. Same for the court, which is in its initial stages of functional or of, of kind of vertical differentiation, but by no means similar to anything we know from the national level in terms of differentiation on the level of the judiciary. So what we have is a strong legislature, so machinery putting out normative claims of compliance and a lack of implementation agencies. And that's the, I think, permanent implementation challenge in EU law. They need to somehow align with the national enforcement agencies, somehow try to get around a persistent risk of non-compliance on part of certain member state agencies. They try to do so by, you know, all the mechanisms, right? The direct effect idea was the first one, but the liability for non-compliance or non-implementation of directives is one. The um, right to sue um, um, or the right of standing given to NGOs is yet another one. There are so many mechanisms by which they try to somehow deal with the implementation challenge. And I would argue it's a persistent one, um, handled, managed quite well, but certainly one of the lasting challenges of supranational governance. Another one, the inbuilt the regulatory bias. Um, many of you will be familiar with this, with this paradigm under the heading of the interplay between positive and negative integration. The idea is negative integration being the liberal market freedom based common market machinery, a court that is authorized, mandated to implement market freedoms and which has basically two options. Either to swipe away national regulatory attempts as undue inhibitors of trade or to leave them in place. Sounds like a nice set of alternatives but the key point is they can't replace any regulatory ambitions. So if they think decentralized regulation is problematic, they swipe it away and they can't replace it. Now we have a machinery for replacing that, that's the legislative machinery on EU level that I talked about, but this is obviously much, much more um, inhibited than any national system. There is, for good reasons you might add, limits to the competences, 
they are strong veto players, etc. And what emerges from this? A very strong machinery of deregulation, the speed of which depends on the willingness of the court to pursue its agenda, but a lack of a counterweight on the positive regulatory level. And what you get from this is, has been, as has been argued many times, this inherent bias towards deregulatory um, policies, uh, deregulatory bias within the EU. Closely linked to that is the dem democratic dilemma. The core reason why you can't just restore positive regulatory power on the central level is, again, very familiar, um, and that is just making Europe, the EU, the super state with all the competences and all the powers and all the easygoing majority-driven procedures might look on paper quite democratic. You could enhance the say that the parliament has in the legislation. You could strengthen um, the individual players, not just have the commission have the right to initiative, etc. But the problem is that democracy does need more than just formal procedures. And the moment we strengthen the central level, we by implication weaken the decentral level. The losses of autonomy, the prices we pay, as I mentioned, will increase, obviously. And that's partly because larger communities mean for the individual to have a more diluted say in the democratic procedure. It also means that the boundaries around the community are certainly not just open to arbitrary drawing. You need to have some kind of sociological substrate to a democracy. A joint public discourse, a shared language in which we can do that. 30 years back when we had these debates in Germany around Maastricht, um, people were really, really pessimistic even on the first criterion that we have a joint language. By now I'd say, looking at these conferences, Everybody's relatively familiar that we join in the English discourse and it's not much of a disadvantage, I think, for most. But still, we still don't have a joint media landscape. We don't have a single one European newspaper that would address the policy decisions on European level and be read by everybody across Europe. If you think about the political parties in the parliament, they form kind of alliances, but they're really different across the different countries. They are not aligned through ideology, but mostly still by national origin. So we're not really there yet, right, in a way. So the democratic dilemma is basically, you can make the EU more democratic, but if you give it more power, um, you weaken the national democracies, and they seem to be the place where democracy, at least traditionally, has been stronger than what we might be able at one point to create on the European level. Finally, last aspect very briefly, the intricacies of put in brackets human rights protection and more generally shared um, sovereignty. Um, obviously, I mean, we can, if you stipulate there is just one sovereign out there by definition and then we can engage in these debates, is sovereignty still with the member states or is it at the EU level? But the reality in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases to be decided is that we're living with some kind of power balance behind a system of shared competences. And this is really hard to grasp. And the human rights, protection intricacies are about this, basically. I think few of us would really feel so strongly about the tiny differences between the adjudication, large scale, um, of the different institutions out there. But the key problem is that they point us to the question of who has the final say, just like the question of who decides who gets which competence, or the question of which court has the final, final say. We are really almost say obsessed with this um, problem of not knowing how to deal with conceptually the idea of shared sovereignty um, because it does, doesn't seem to conform arguably with the 
paradigms that we have been using over and over again in order to understand the EU, and that is it being somewhere on its way between nation state and international organization, both of which would be built on the presumption of a clear answer to this question of um, sovereignty. And shared sovereignty is something at odds with that. Finally, last point, and I realize uh, I should be quick, and I will, sorry. <laughs> um, the ways out, do we really need any ways out? I mean, obviously, all the intricacies, the problems of uh, supranational governance might invite us to look for a solution either way. You could get rid of the intricacies of supranational governance by ending it, by returning to international organization style governance or nation state governance. Problem is that this is an extremely limited perspective. If you take a broader view and if you just recall the reasons which I briefly sketched why we have the EU, this might be a bad solution. Even though supranational governance is incredibly unsatisfactory. I would suggest hence that if we tackle this question, we take something like a balance sheet approach. For each country, maybe even for smaller groups, we ask ourselves what is good and bad about being part of the EU. And I agree, balance sheets will be incredibly complex, so many aspects in there. Everybody's a winner and a loser in some way with regard to European integration. They are extremely diverse, different for each country, and even within a country, different for each group. And they're changing over time, definitely. What might be a good choice in the beginning, look at Brexit. Maybe it has a view of some never been a good choice, but certainly um, at some point, views had changed around that. But I think, and that's my main point, we need to make sure that the balance sheet is complete. Um, finally, last slide, a summary. What I'm trying to say is we should take the sui generis seriously. It's something different. It's not a nation state or international organization, and it shouldn't be. By using this as a yardstick, we shouldn't idealize the yardstick. Makes sense to compare, but it doesn't mean that um, either side of the continuum is the ideal. Second, supranationally, supranationality features major problems. F absolutely agree, granted. But it may still be the best option available that we have. Third one, the shape of supranationality needs constant reassessment and potentially also readjustment. That's what I said in the beginning. That's why I said in the beginning, I think we need to talk about Europe and we probably have to continuously talk about Europe. I think the EU's constitutional setup, and I use setup deliberately and not say constitution, needs to retain fluidity more so than nation states. Even the rules of the game need to be to some extent negotiable over time. And at the present stage of European integratedness, there is no preset direction anymore for future evolution. We should get rid of this monodimensional um, directionality in the debate, an ever closer union. I'm, I'm looking forward to what, what the Italian colleague is going to convey to us later um, today. But I think the ever closer union paradigm um, doesn't seem to fit um, many people's aspirations. I very much like Peter's reference to the American uh, pendant, the more perfect union, and I might add that the notion of a superlative for perfect seems to be very American. Finally, um, we should continue, I think, uh, but that's a very personal statement, to cultivate supranationality. It's an uneasy concept, it's an uneasy stage, but it might be the best that we have. Sorry for running over time. Thank you very much. Thank you.